Okay, well, I think we'll get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. This is the second in a series of webinars um, directed at publishers. Um, I'm Heather Staines. I'm the Director of Partnerships for Hypothesis, and I'd like to introduce my colleague, Nate Angel, uh, who's our Marketing Director. Greetings, everyone. Working on the, a lot of the, talking over a lot of the slides today with me. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We have had all the attendees join in um, mute mode, <clears throat> um, and that's just to keep the noise down, uh, you know, during the during the presentation. Um, but when we take questions at the end, um, just give us an indicator in the chat box that you have a question, and we will unmute you, and and you have the opportunity then to to ask your question. We will be recording this webinar for later viewing if you have colleagues who are not able to attend today. Um, so we'll be sharing that out and it will be available via our publisher website. I'll, I'll be putting some links into the chat as we go along to help guide people toward things that we mentioned. Great. So first I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're going to be covering today. We can go to the agenda. Um, first, we'll go into a little bit of um, information about how Hypothesis works. Um, then uh, we'll talk about how easy it is to integrate Hypothesis into your platform. Uh, we'll talk about options that are available if you elect to have Hypothesis um, assist you uh, with that implementation. And then we should have time for questions at the end. So as many of you know, you're, you're joining here today a little bit about Hypothesis. Um, we're in a kind of a unique position. We are a nonprofit um, tech company. Um, and we can do things a little bit differently because of that. Um, we're beholden to partners who share our vision um, rather than investors who share our company. Uh, we won't be bought by the competition. Um, we work with targeted small um, groups uh, to build up our audience strategically. Um, we build up quite a considerable number of users that way. We create open source software so we can involve the community in the roadmap and development of Hypothesis, and we depend on open standards for that same reason. In February of this year, the W3C, the standards body for the web, did approve annotation as a web standard. So what that means is in future, uh, browsers will come with annotation capability built natively. So just like you choose your default search engine, you'll be able to select which annotation client you prefer to use. Very excited about that development. So first, a little bit about how Hypothesis works. And uh, Heather's going to uh, pass the baton over to me to talk for a few minutes. And we're just going to um, we're, we're working with the assumption that most people on the call are already familiar with annotation, of course, and, and hypothesis in particular. So there's a couple of things we're just going to spend some time reminding you about, um, about the basics about annotation and hypothesis so that to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, but the key uh, of this, uh, this kind of conversation that we want to have is to help you understand how easy it is to get Hypothesis integrated into your own website or, or publishing platform. And so we're going to start out um, by um, talking uh, just for a second about um, what the kind of basic capabilities of what Hypothesis uh, is trying to do uh, consist of. And so the first one is the, uh, the idea that Hypothesis enables uh, users to annotate in layers over the top of documents that are in their canonical locations. And so this is a little bit different than some other annotation platforms that ask documents to be moved to a different location in order to be annotated. And so one of the, this is really key to publishing, right? Because the idea is to keep your publications in their, in their canonical locations and add annotation on top as an extra capability that can enrich the experience on top of that publication. So that's one of the key uh, key elements of, of uh, the difference that Hypothesis brings to the table. Um, and then this is just a really simplified schematic diagram to remind people that there's two major pieces of technology at play in Hypothesis. And it's a what you might call a, a common client server architecture, right? So the client is the tool that we as users uh, interact with on top of documents in order to do the actual annotation work. Um, that client speaks to a server where 
we authenticate as users and it stores our annotations uh, and the references to the documents that they belong to uh, over time so that they can persist so we can log out log in come back and, uh, and, and search and browse our annotations in other, in other areas. And so understanding this, uh, the difference between the client and the server is one of the kind of fundamental things to bring to this, to this conversation. And so what we're gonna talk about um, in, in this uh, next part is about ways in which users uh, are able to access the annotation client, right? So Hypothesis is hosting a kind of default uh, server environment that's a reference implementation of an annotation server and the easiest way to um, be able to take advantage of that uh, that kind of service that we are offering to the world is to um, equip yourself as a user with uh, the client so that you can go out and start annotating uh, and those annotations would be stored in, in Hypothesis default server environment. So there's a couple of different ways that, that folks can get those, uh, that client, that Hypothesis client to start annotating. Uh, there's ways for people to just share links um, to annotations that they've made that then uh, even if the people that they're sharing with don't have access or know about Hypothesis or annotation, they can click on that link and it will bring up the document that's been annotated, the annotation and the client to start using it. They may not have an account yet, but they can at least start to browse. So that's like the, the sort of easiest way that people end up getting acquainted with the client. Um, there's also, uh, if you're a user who's made the choice to equip yourself fully uh, with a cl client and you want to use it uh, like Heather does, uh, Heather holds the record as the human being with the most, the most annotations. Um, there are some robots who beat her out, but just barely. So um, she equips herself by having a browser plug in. And so she carries the client with her to every website she goes to. Well, what we want to talk today, though, is about uh, from the publisher perspective, how you can embed the client in your publishing property in your website or platform so that every user that comes to your site has the annotation cap capability already waiting for them there uh, rather than uh, having to know about it in advance, have a link or have, or have the client embedded in their browser. So embedding the client in, in the website is the easiest way for uh, a publisher to deploy annotation on their website and um, and take the next steps to uh, to kind of enable annotation for all their users and so it's really easy uh, I'm a non-technical person I have a little bit of technical background but it's the kind of thing that I can do in fact I've integrated uh, hypothesis on my personal blog um, and uh, it was really easy to do uh, and um, just walk through the steps of, of how that happens. Uh, so in a basic implementation, which there's no cost to do, uh, there's a, a simple step for the integration piece, which we're just about to talk about. And that brings all the kind of basic primary annotation capabilities to all the users who show up in your, in your publishing website or platform. So uh, let's just uh, take a look at what the, the integration looks like. And so to, to, to embed the client in a website or platform, uh, there's really only one single step that needs to happen. And that's a single line of code that we just sh showing you the example here on the screen that uh, reaches out and grabs the default standard hypothesis annotation client and brings it into your platform so that every user has it available to them as they're browsing your your publications. Um, and so there's a couple of different ways that you can get this line of code into your, into your platform. And we'll talk about those in just a second. But the point is, is that, um, you know, it's much like adding uh, Google Analytics or some of the other uh, tools that are out there that are offered to the, to the web. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of embedding this single line of code into, into your platform. Uh, and as we go along, if there are questions, uh, feel free to feel free to use the chat or the um, question feature in Zoom to, um, to uh, queue them up and we'll, we'll answer them when we get to questions and answers. So uh, now obviously, if you wanna embed the client in your, uh, in your website or publication, um, you know, the, the technical folks who, who steward that uh, for you, whether it's you or someone else, can probably just manually add that line of code in, um, but there are uh, several different platforms that already have a kind of um, native module or plugin 
that adds the hypothesis client to to their platform and you can just see the list here it's not every platform uh, that publishers might use but a couple of key ones that are more commonly used um, that uh, the open source community or hypothesis have collaborated to make uh, these plugins so that they can be easily embedded into these systems so you think things like uh, Drupal and WordPress and OJS and Omeka um, the other uh, way that uh, some publishers are now integrating hypothesis is by working with their platform hosts. So with folks like Adapon, Highwire, and Genta, and Silverchair um, are looking to enable uh, annotation for any of their publishers who are, who are using their platforms. And so if you are a publisher who uses one of these um, these uh, sort of uh, you know more universal publishing platform providers um, uh, talk to us and we can we can help guide you to the way that it's easiest to work with that publishing platform to get hypothesis integrated into your into your system um, so that's you know just to recap there's a couple of different ways but this is how easy it is there's a line of code that needs to appear in your website and that will make the client appear for all users and then there's a couple of easier ways to help uh, that line of code appear in your platform if you're using one of these particular systems. Now there are configuration options and we're not going to go into a bunch of detail about all the different um, sort of nuances that you can uh, add to, to the client uh, once you get it in there. But just as an example, um, some folks want to um, make sure that the annotations don't um, kind of interrupt the initial viewing experience of their publication. So they want the highlights that are anchored to the annotations to be hidden by default and uh, enable the user to just turn on highlighting if they open the client uh, from, from its controls and, and start to actually read the annotations. And so with just one simple configuration line, uh, you can you can make sure that the highlighting is, is hidden by default and there are other configuration options as well We'll be distributing these slides to all the participants um, as we go along uh, So that you can have all the links to this uh, to this work uh, And so just to remind uh, folks so you if you've taken this step right of embedding the client into your your uh, your publication platform, um, what does it bring you, right? So it brings all your users a universal client, client that allows them to do all the kind of um, standard capabilities of, of highlighting and annotation that, that Hypothesis offers. Um, they would, uh, in order to actually start annotating, they would need to create a, an annotating account so that their annotations could be stored in the server environment. And in this kind of default basic implementation, they would be creating a hypothesis account, an account managed in the hypothesis namespace for our default server environment. Um, and we can talk about other options, but in this kind of free basic service, you can get all the capabilities for all your users um, and they, uh, they would walk in the door with all the capabilities of the client. Um, behind that client, right, each user and, and group that they might annotate in also has a very robust annotation dashboard that kind of brings all their annotations together into a collection that they can browse and search um, using various parameters. They can um, view annotations and collections of tags or through time. Uh, and they can see both their public annotations, their private annotations, they can share their annotations from there and they can jump back to the context of the pages where they made the annotations. So there's a very kind of rich dashboard environment for people to look at their full collection of annotations. Um, and then a couple of other points to make about the, what this basic service brings to your, to your, um, you know, your publications if you embed it. So um, uh, we're just about to announce work on the completion of annotation capability in EPUB, which adds the third major publishing format to uh, the capability set. So um, regardless now of whether you publish your documents primarily in HTML, PDF, or EPUB, or all three, uh, you can now enable annotation um, for your users in, in those formats. And here's uh, the interesting thing. Not only can you enable annotation, but if you publish the same document in a variety of formats, uh, there's a kind of uh, architecture of document equivalence behind that that enables folks to annotate in a PDF version and have those annotations also appear in a canonical HTML version, for example. Um, 
users who make annotations in a PDF um, that they've downloaded to their computer that has the same fingerprint as the canonical PDF uh, on your website, those annotations will also uh, find each other because they're uh, hooked together behind the scenes uh, using uh, a, a, a PDF fingerprinting technique that allows uh, PDFs to know uh, or it allows hypothesis to know that the same PDF is being annotated in multiple places. So um, there's kind of a rich array of different ways that um, that uh, documents can be annotated in different locations and in different formats. The other thing that's um, sort of uh, included in this easy step of getting annotation up and, and running on your on your platform is behind hypothesis there's a full-blown API. So even without um, doing any more technical work on your side other than that, you know, making sure that there's that one line of code in your system. Uh, there's an API that, uh, you know, if you have technical resources and you want to do things that go beyond that embedding, you can um, orchestrate different kinds of calls to that API and do uh, a variety of different things to annotations programmatically behind the scenes. So if you wanted to take steps beyond what the basic service delivers, the API is sitting there waiting for you to use as well. Uh, and so that's, you know, that that is uh, the kind of uh, quick overview of the rich array of basic annotation capabilities that are delivered to you um, if you just add that single line of code to your property. So uh, I'm going to hand the baton back to Heather and she's going to talk about taking integration uh, a step further and some of the more uh, customized things that you can do. I think you might be muted, Heather. Thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, so as Nate mentioned, because we are open source and permissively licensed, you can go ahead and, you know, take a significant action um, uh, on your own part. Um, but if you want something a little bit more custom or if you are not entirely comfortable taking, you know, those steps uh, on your own, uh, we're happy to help you. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Nate? Sure. <clears throat> so with the um, customized and supported implementation, you get everything that Nate already explained as a part of the basic implementation, uh, but we'll help you uh, do the integration on your platform. We have a very simple pricing model that's based on the number of documents that you publish in a year. Um, and it, there is a volume discount, so the more uh, pages you um, deploy the client across, um, the cheaper that it gets. Um, if you're, um, if you wish, we can also hook up to your account system um, so that your users do not have to create a separate account um, and, you know, the single sign on is, is handled and annotation happens seamlessly. A lot of publishers have asked us to create for them uh, those layers that, that Nate mentioned, a publisher branded and moderated layer. Um, so it's clear which is the authoritative layer for the publication. Um, there's a number of UI customizations that we can make, uh, and we have a program to ensure successful training and rollout. We also offer support and open source maintenance. Let's go a little bit um, deeper. So the publisher groups, as I mentioned, um, they are uh, customized to meet your brand. Um, you can decide as a publisher who will be creating an annotations and who will be able to see them. So for example, if you want to use annotation to create additional content, whether that's on, by your authors, whether that's passing along reviewer comments or invited experts, um, you could limit the annotations to that group, but it would be visible to the public. Um, or if you're really more interested in a post publication conversation layer, um, you can set up one that um, anyone can enjoy, can join and create annotations. Um, a moderation capabilities, um, certainly possible. And um, you can choose um, how the client will be visible um, on your screen. For example, if you, would, if you want a button to appear that lets folks know that annotation capabilities are possible and they click the button and that opens the client, that's one possibility, or the client can be open with the annotations visible by default. Um, all of that is completely uh, in your hands. Um, we offer a number of UI customizations so that you can uh, fit the sidebar uh, best uh, to your platform. That includes um, options in colors and borders, typefaces. 
Um, how wide do you want the sidebar to open to in case so that you, it's not covering up your content, for example. Um, Nate mentioned um, the visibility of, of highlights. Um, we also have a number of options for calls to action. So how you would let your users know, again, that annotation is possible on the page. Uh, next slide. I think the most important thing to note is we don't expect um, you to do this entirely on your own. Um, if you do deploy um, Hypothesis um, yourselves, we're also happy to help you with a, with a rollout and an ongoing collaboration. Um, and, and certainly, you know, we want you to be successful and achieve the goals that, um, that you set out from the beginning. So we always talk with our publishers about what they're trying to achieve. Um, we can put together trainings for your internal staff. Um, for example, if the journal editors are not clear on why annotation might be of interest to users, then certainly that cannot be communicated um, to authors and other external stakeholders. So we can do some internal trainings and record those for you, um, as well as um, end user oriented trainings. Again, um, materials that can be available via your site as well as ours to help people get started. We can work with you to talk about how best to engage um, the folks who will be the key annotators on your content. Um, we can tell you, um, you know, success stories that have happened with other platforms, um, techniques like getting authors to uh, annotate their own work, um, invited experts to seed the conversation, for example. And we're happy to work with you on a coordinated program, um, both on the rollout and subsequent um, uh, launch materials, blog posts. We'd love to talk to you about the possibility of presenting together at upcoming industry events. And as annotation um, exists on your platform for a little bit longer, we'd love to explore with you unique case studies and maybe put together some white papers that we can in turn share with other communities. Nate, would you like to take this one? You're, you're muted, Nate. Um. So one of the uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, background uh, activities that Hypothesis does with our collaboration partners when we're working together closely is um, uh, we basically become like your support provider the way that you would with a typical commercial vendor um, and uh, provide all that kind of functional and technical support, not only for you, your team, uh, whether they're technical or editorial, but also for your end users. So uh, it becomes a kind of help desk service then uh, for you so that you don't have to have your support team uh, train up in all the nuances of annotation. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, Hypothesis is always maintaining this open source code base um, and there's a link here that that will share out to a deeper technical dive for those of you who are um, you know more technical and want to understand a little bit more about the architecture behind it um, but uh, so as an entity we're stewarding the open source licensing so all the contributions for that making sure that the uh, the open source contributions that are made by various developers are, are properly attributed and licensed um, maintaining that code base for security issues and and um, you know as technology advances it needs a kind of care and feeding and then advancing development on it so when we roll out new capabilities they are added to that code base and uh, become available to a wider array of folks and so for instance this um, publisher group tech uh, capability that Heather was talking about is a relatively new capability that is now part of the open source code base and uh, uh, it does need some extra work in order to be enabled for folks. It doesn't, it's not part of the default package, but it is there as something that, uh, that can be uh, used by everyone. Um, we're also part of the, uh, the group that works in general on uh, standards and operability for annotation. So, uh, you know, part of our nonprofit mission is not just to serve uh, the hypothesis annotation community, but also to move forward work on annotation in general for for everyone. And so we were um, we were definitely part of that group that worked collaboratively to uh, uh, establish the W3C standards on annotation, and we continue to work in those fields um, to advance annotation across the board with with other folks. Um, and we do that really in the context of a wider community. Um, so, so many of you may already be aware of or even members of the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition, which is uh, a kind of community group that we pulled together of now, I think it's over 60, right, Heather? Right. Uh, over 70. 
over 70 organizations that have come together um, and we can show you who some of those are if you're more if you're interested in more detail around advancing they come together around advancing annotation as a, as a general practice and technology um, and uh, once a year we hold an I annotate conference um, usually in the spring in the May time frame uh, where we bring to together people not only from publishing but from other fields like education journalism and research science and scholarship who are all working on annotation in various ways uh, to kind of have a have a deeper community experience uh, in a live live environment um, just a, a small plug um, Heather will be um, in Berlin at the force 2017 conference um, that's coming up what are the dates for that Heather so the, the FORCE um, conference is the 25th through 27th. Um, we're holding a face-to-face -face meeting for the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition on the 24th of October. So if you want more information on that, um, we, can, we can provide that as well. We'd love to see you, especially if you've got a use case that you want to present. Great. And so there are other things that we do across the community. There's really vibrant things going on now in the sort of um, news credibility arena. And there's a, a variety of different organizations that have sparked up around that, um, that pesky problem uh, that we're involved in as well. And so there are other examples. But the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition is really uh, the kind of community uh, group that, that we work with in order to uh, kind of develop the publishing and, and scholarly um, annotation agenda, if you will. Uh, so uh, we'd love to see any of you who are going to be at 417 to also um, be a part of that uh, annotating all knowledge um, uh, meeting. And that's really going to be an interesting conversation focused on the fair principles for annotation and data in scholarly publishing. Uh, so um, that's that's the end of our presentation and so we wanted to move to questions and answers um i've got one question queued up here uh, in the queue that someone's asked that we'll address um but if you in the course of this presentation have come up with another question and you just like to to ask it via text you can do that either in the chat or the question and answer tool in zoom uh, and we'll we'll address it. Um, if you would like to have a, a little bit deeper conversation, so for example, you've got a particular uh, publishing platform or scenario that you'd like to talk about in more detail, we can actually um, promote you to a status where you have audio capabilities and, and can, can be part of a conversation. So we're getting a couple questions queued up now, um, and I'll address them and then uh, invite Heather to uh, speak to them if that's, uh, if that's the right thing to do, which it often will be. So one of the first questions that we uh, had was about, um, we mentioned that there are bots or robots or machines annotating uh, in the hypothesis platform. And so could we explain that more and maybe give an example? Did you want to take that one, Heather? Sure. Um, probably the, the largest example, and, and, and there are numerous incidents out there, is one of our um, staff members, Marianne Martone, is a, is a neuroscientist. And uh, about, I think about 125 of the neuroscience journals use things called RRIDs, research reference IDs. Um, and these are particularly important for folks who need to reproduce experiments. They may, to, may need to know a specific stem cell line for say, say a mouse that they're using or where a particular reagent was purchased. So these RRIDs are typed into the papers and there's an external database um, that you can go and, and look them up. Well, what um, the folks at UCSD um, have developed um, together with Marianne is, a, is an annotation robot called Cybot, which when they load up the papers on the browser, it automatically looks for these RIDs and then it actually um, pops the resolution from the database up in the form of an annotation card on the side. So it's got all the information on that RID. It's also got a tag so you can explore which other papers have referenced that same RID. So um, in, in this instance, the annotation um, capability is almost incidental. It's the way that the information is being retrieved and displayed. We've also had conversations with other publishers who have entities um, embedded in their, in, their paper, in their publications, and these may well be linked to an external database, but wouldn't it be great to have the opportunity to have the information from that external database appear on your page so your users could see it without navigating away from the content? Um, and we'd love to explore you know, other use cases along those lines. Yeah, you know, another really interesting case uh, similar to Cybot came up recently uh, in conversation with one of the, uh, the publishers who's deploying Hypothesis. Uh, so there's a, a, 
a uh, uh, kind of collaboration and organiz nonprofit organization called Refigure that is focused on identifying when um, when uh, uh, figures or diagrams are are or pictures are used in scientific literature in more than one place. So it's a little bit like the Cybot RRID uh, question is, you know, is this resource, in this case a picture, a figure, or a diagram, being used in multiple scholarly works? And mm -hmm. so uh, we're now in a kind of preliminary conversation about the idea of um, having the ability for an annotation layer to let you know if any figures or pictures in the scholarly work that you're reading are also used in other scholarly works and what those are. So it's another way to use the annotation layer to sew together scholarly works kind of across the whole, the whole um, work. So there's um, a, a couple of other uh, questions coming up. Uh, folks have asked if we were going to share the slides, and yes, we will. We, uh, when you registered for the webinar, uh, you submitted your email, and so we'll email you a link to the slides um, so that you can share them as well as to a recording for uh, the webinar as a whole. So we will definitely uh, do that, and you'll get that in your email. Um, it will also be posted on our website in a blog format, um, similar to the blog page that you probably visited when you uh, when you registered. Um, uh, there's uh, a question too about um, um, from Beata about um, can different formats of content be related by DOI so that annotations made on the HTML version would be displayed on the PDF and vice versa? And yes, I, I glossed over this. Um, a little bit. Did you want to um, go into more detail about that, Heather? Or sure. I mean, this so this is um, already happening. Um, you know, in many publisher websites, when I when I go to do demos, um, an annotation um, will uh, that's made on the HTML will appear um, on the the PDF. Um, and one of the ways that we relate documents um, is via citation uh, DOI tag. Um, another way uh, Nate had in the slide is the um, is the is the rel canonical rel uh, tag to show that one URL is equivalent is equivalent document at another URL. And there's a couple of other ways, you know, that we can relate documents as well. Um, if for some reason um, your particular website the annotations made on the HTML do not appear on the PDF. Usually we can look, um, you know, really quickly at the metadata um, and, and, and kind of make a determination as to why that's not happening. Usually it, it will happen without any additional work to be done on the publisher side, but sometimes we need to nose around a little bit. But um, certainly, um, yeah, we're excited about that capability. Hey, is this an opportunity to mention the Crossref collaboration as well? Um, sure, we're in conversations with Crossref to determine um, what particular types of DOIs, for example, uh, types of annotations might be useful to assign a DOI to. Um, in, a re in a related conversation, we're also speaking with the folks at, at ORCID to see if, um, if folks might be able to indicate that they want particular annotations to connect with their ORCID profile. So DOIs is one way that um, that, that can happen. All of the annotations that are made in Hypothesis that are in the public layer, so visible to anyone, are being included in the Crossref's event data project. So those annotations will be indexed by Google and surfaceable and uh, 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 discoverable. Um, so it's a great um, additional way for users to find your content if, it, if annotations have been made on that. Right, okay. Um, uh, another question, um, we got actually a, a couple of them now. So. Um, Keep them coming. This is a great conversation. Um, so, uh, and I'll take this one, Heather. Um, a user had asked uh, if uh, I'm sorry, an attendee had asked if the users are annotating on a publisher's website, could they download the PDF with the annotations? And so, um, here's one of the uh, sort of interesting conceptual things that that uh, took me a while to get through my own my own head um, before I could really understand it. The annotations are not embedded in the document; they're served. Uh, to the document because the annotations are related to that document's unique identifier, whether that be a URL, a DOI, a PDF fingerprint, or whatever it is. And so it's not as if the annotations are embedded in the document and need to be downloaded with a PDF version. It's rather that if you download a PDF that has been annotated that has a specific fingerprint, um, that uh, and you open that PDF in a browser environment connected to the web, then uh, Hypothesis can uh, look through its database of annotations and find any that are related to that. 
PDF and its unique fingerprint. So um, it's it's the the annotations don't travel with the document. They are hooked to the document by some kind of unique identifier, and that's what allows um, a PDF that's that's being worked on in one user's environment to have uh, contact with annotations that might be being made on that same PDF, even though it's in use on another user's computer uh, in a different environment, as long as that PDF has the same uh, unique identifier in it. Yeah, one um, you know, sort of additional thing to add to that, we have had publishers who have um, said that it might be useful uh, to offer um, readers the opportunity to download a PDF that um, has annotations included. Um, so with our API, if that's something that was important to you, depending upon how you serve up your PDFs on your site, that it may well be possible for you to do that with just a little bit of, um, uh, of work. Um, for example, we have peer review integrations um, underway. Um, one of them is with eJournal Press. And in, in addition to making peer reviewer comments available to authors um, via the annotations on top of the document, they have um, enabled the annotations to be uh, presented together you know, with the PDF. So there's a lot of options and we'd be happy to talk with you about how that might be possible if you think that that's a use case that would be well received by your readers. Yeah, just to point out, um, Heather's uh, email there is on the screen and so she's certainly uh, the best first point of contact for any kind of uh, conversation that will go beyond this webinar. Uh, so. Another question that's come up is if we could talk a little bit more about um, the different kinds of groups and the permissions that are associated with them. Do you want to take a stab at that, Heather? Yeah. So, um, you know, first when we talk to publishers, we we try to figure out what uh, you know they want to achieve with groups. Um, I mentioned uh, briefly that some publishers see annotations as additional content, and they want to limit the creation of annotations to. Um, you know, folks who are, you know, credentialed with the document, authors, for example, or um, only the, the publisher staff. So we do have, um, you know, permissions that we can provide um, that will, you know, fulfill those purposes as well as um, different levels of uh, accessibility in terms of who can create an annotation, whether it's it's re whether they can only read them or whether they can reply, whether they need to log into your website to reply, you know, mechanisms for joining a group. Um, in the peer reviewer context, for example, um, there are multiple roles that need to be represented. Um, whether someone is a is the editor, uh, reviewer one, reviewer two, um, if it's a if it's a blinded review, you know, and the author, and so different um, roles can be assigned to meet that uh, flow. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, there, for each of the private groups, for example, that you can make on Hypothesis Now, the person who creates the group serves as the admin for the group, can moderate the group for the publisher group, um, publishers um, designate moderator to take care of, um, you know, any problematic, you know, annotations that, that come up. So it is, um, it is very granular and, you know, we can work out something that will meet your needs. Yeah, and I think the, uh, the, the sort of general takeaway from that is the idea that, um, you know, each group basically has its own annotation layer. If we go back to that metaphor of annotations living on layers on top of documents. And so the configuration of those groups is very flexible, as uh, Heather was pointing out, about who can write to that layer and who can read that layer or see that layer and what kind of roles they have. So the idea is not so much to have, um, you know, only these set kinds of groups, but to be able to enable various kinds of configurations of groups that have different kinds of permissions depending on the need that a publisher might have. Uh, so um, I will take this one. Uh, so have um, implementers normally embedded hypothesis with their entire portfolio or have some made it available on just a portion and do we support trials? So, um, so technically this is, uh, anything is possible technically, right? Because if we go back to the simple integration, it's about whether or not that single line of code appears on a particular web page, for example, um, to have the client enabled. And so if one wanted to make annotation available on only a single, um, say, publication on your site, it would be easy enough to do as long as you could insert that code only on that single page. Some of the plugins have the capability to, um, uh, deliver the client granularly in that way. Like I know, for instance, the WordPress plugin has some controls that allow you to decide um, where on your on your platform you want that delivered. So it's certainly possible 
to deploy the client in only specific environments. Um, you know, you might just choose a single article, a single journal, um, depending on a single book, uh, depending on what it is that, that you're doing. So it's entirely possible and it really comes down to, um, you know, what the details of actually getting the client code into your platform would look like. Um, so, uh, so in, in the sense of supporting trials, well, the basic implementation, implementation that we're talking about, right, is, um, is completely free uh, and you can go, you can walk away from this webinar and implement it yourself uh, later today if you want, um, if you have that, that kind of access to your platform to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a way to start a trial, if you will, of, of the basic service without doing anything more than, than just walking away with the documentation that you'll receive an email from this, from this webinar. Um, the, the concept, you know, doing a trial of the more uh, kind of robust, customized and supported um, uh, sort of model that that hypothesis is offering is is a different question and i'll see what heather has to say about that yeah um talk talk to me uh you know send me a message about that you know um effectively as nate mentioned because you can deploy hypothesis over just a small portion of your content and because our prices are based on um you know the number of documents is employed deployed across um you know it's a really affordable way uh to to get started um, and we have got some some offers out there with some of the platform hosts, you know, some of you may have heard where you can try, you know, for a certain number of months and, and decide whether the, you want to keep it or not. So I'd say reach out to me and let's talk about a specific um, circumstance. And, and maybe that's a good way to segue here because someone had asked in what our general pricing model is for that um, uh, customized and supported uh, mm -hmm. model. Uh, so if you want to speak about that generally and then how people uh, can kind of talk with you more directly about um, specific pricing for their publications. Yeah, I saw that there was a question in the in the chat about if you had a, a thousand publications um, annually, you know, approximately what it would cost. I did look this up for someone um, earlier in the week who asked about the the thousand uh, document mark, um, and as my recollection was, it was about thirty seven hundred. Um, you know, I'd have to double check that. So. Uh, you know, don't hold me to it off the top of my head, but um, you know, it, it's designed so that smaller publishers can participate, um, larger publishers who just want to try things out and in, in, in either different types of publications or, or certain journals where there may be a desire expressed for annotation, you know, can do that. So um, we're happy to work with you and find something that meets your budget. Yeah, and the costs are, are relatively low anyway, and those costs are annual, uh, right? It's an annual yes. support and subscription agreement. Mm -hmm. Great, so we have uh, just kind of, um, happy to take more questions, but we have just kind of one uh, group of questions here left that are related. Um, so have we ever thought about giving pub loans to annotators the score point system to reward, reward reviewers? Is that something you've, uh, you've heard about, Heather? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked with publishers, um, particularly in, in the area of how to determine success with annotations. Um, one way to determine success might be, uh, for example, number of annotations made. Similarly, we've talked with Altmetric about including annotations out as an Altmetric. You know, what does the number of annotations on a piece of content, uh, you know, show about it? So, um, you know, it, it is something that, you know, we'd be interested in exploring further. We're also working with some, some groups to actually try to look into the content of annotations. A document may have a lot of annotations to say that are responding negatively to the, to the content. Um, so can you make a kind of sentiment analysis of, of annotations? Um, so I think, um, you know, we'd like to try out uh, anything that, um, that makes sense and, and kind of see where it goes. That's the, one of the advantages of um, being a, start up and you know being open source and community driven so we're we're out of questions in the queue um, certainly um, we're happy to stick around and talk more um, I noticed a couple of people have dropped off um, but uh, if anyone else has a question we've got one more uh, uh, is hypothesis financially sustainable and can we share something about our finances so Hypothesis is grant funded. It's been around for about six years so far. Um, some of our funders are the Mellon Foundation, Omidyar Network, Shuttleworth, Sloan, um, Helmsley. 
Um, so we're, we're well, uh, you know, well taken care of in that regard. We did make a decision last year to transition to um, be revenue supported. Um, so that's something that our early publisher partners and education partners, which will be the topic of another webinar, um, you know, are, are, are working with us. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to be around for a long time. Yeah. And, and the other thing to say there, so, right. So we just talked about pricing, right? So the, our financial sustainability model is built on the idea of, um, you know, offering real value to partners uh, in exchange for uh, financial contributions that keep the nonprofit open source project um, uh, kind of sustainable. And, but the other point about this is that unlike um, some sort of commercial startup operation that, um, you know, could uh, kind of lose its financial stability and go away, um, if we think about the exit strategy that Hypothesis offers, by uh, our entire uh, code base and all of the documentation that are related to it are completely open source. So let's say even in the worst case scenario where the organization of Hypothesis itself went away, um, all the resources and assets that Hypothesis had worked to develop would still exist and be publicly available for continuation in a variety of different ways, right? A commercial entity could take them up and move them forward. Uh, a publisher could, could you know, bring all this work in-house uh, and, and, and do it themselves. So the, um, the possibility- That would negate the open sourceness of it, just to be clear. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it, it's, it's not possible to make it not open source. But because it is open source, um, hypothesis as an ongoing entity doesn't need to persist in order for the technology to persist. Yeah. But I should say, um, you know, some folks have asked us about the business model, given that you can deploy hypothesis yourself and not even tell us. Um, and so we usually say take WordPress as an example. 20% um, of the content on the web um, is deployed on, on WordPress and it's free to use, but a very small percentage. Um, of um, entities would like a more customer enterprise version of WordPress and that small percentage of the larger pie supports a company with more than 700 employees. So that's the model that we're working towards. Yeah, and the point is, is, um, you know, our primary mission is to advance annotation. Uh, so the sustainability of the organization it only needs to happen to the degree that it can enable us to advance annotation uh, technology and practices overall. And so we're not we're not in a position where we need to look for uh, the kind of profit that a for-profit uh, entity would need in order to um, be appealing to investors. So that that enables us to have um, a lower threshold for sustainability. Um, so a couple of other questions just on the open source uh, points though. Has anyone forked the code in the way that we're talking about? And I think the answer to that is, is a clear yes. There are organizations out there that have um, that are using the code and they may have forked it and are using it in ways that uh, it's because it's permissively licensed, they don't have to report back uh, their forks unless they want to. Um, so they can uh, kind of take the code and run, so to speak, and uh, go, you know, work in their own sort of cul-de-sac of code and continue to absorb new innovations that come through the open source channel. Um, they're not required to share back what they do because of the permissive licensing. Um, so there are organizations that have done that. I don't have a ready example at mine. Maybe Heather does. Um, I don't have one right at hand, but I know that it has happened when when folks do approach us and ask about forking the code. We always um, try to discourage that because, of course, subsequent developments, they need to go back and, you know, pursue those separately and, you know, they wouldn't be supported by our main code base. So in order to take advantage of the continual development and the community development, the code, we, we discourage it, but certainly um, it happens. Um, I see there's another question. Are there open source contributors outside our paid staff? Too many to count. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want, there's there's some Slack channels, um, you know, that you can join, and that's where a lot of the developers, um, you know, bring their uh, their contributions and their questions. And it's just a really vibrant um, community. Uh, and and maybe Nate, when you um, include the slides, we can put um, information on how they could join those those public discussion channels, so they can really see what's going on in the wider sense. Yeah, and I was just going to mention um, one of the greatest examples, I think, uh, recently of that kind of, um, you know, multiple, um, multiple folks participating in the open source development is the partnership that's recently 
uh, kind of come to fruition around bringing annotation into EPUBs. Uh, so that actually involved um, partners, uh, including a scholarly press, a university, uh, a software company that's been devoting its, itself to EPUB technologies, and uh, a foundation, um, the, a nonprofit foundation that's also focused on EPUB technologies. And so there's a constellation of folks. Oh, and, and an additional open source project as well that makes a, a, an open source EPUB reader um, EPUB JS. And so there was like, you know, uh, you know, five different participants, um, uh, several of them contributing developers to a common effort. Um, and so I'm just going to throw into the chat here a link to our the developers uh, page on our website, which um, kind of gives you access to all so the code base, the different community, the technical communities and Slack channel that um, Heather was talking about uh, and things like that. So, uh, and just uh, one uh, caveat about the developer Slack channel. Um, we are just about to transition that to a new Slack environment that has unlimited uh, uh, space for users and channels. So that's just about to get a little bit more robust. The other thing that I would invite people to do um, is uh, we had spoken about um, the Annotating All Knowledge uh, Coalition and so if you're a publisher and you're not already a part of Annotating All Knowledge, um, I'm going to share the link for it here in the chat as well. And we'll make you sure that... You don't have to be a publisher, so if you're not a publisher oh, sorry. You're joining, you may join as well. Oops, sorry, I, I just shared the same link again. That wasn't really helpful, was it? It's free um, to join. Um, we just ask a couple questions about, you know, your, your kind of commitment to, to annotation. We, ha we ask you to collaborate with others. Um, and, and preferably do that annotation in an open source um, interoperable um, standards based way um, so that that others can benefit. But we do have um, uh, commercial entities in the group that are not open source. So those um, joining requirements are, you know, flexible. And I'll just point out that the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition, AAK as we call it, also has its own uh, kind of Slack community environment, which is also free to join. And that's uh, a great place where a lot of this collaboration, both technical and non-technical happens. Uh, so I just put a link into uh, where you can join that Slack if you kind of want to continue the conversation um, in the broader annotation community. Uh, so we've run out of questions again, and we're actually getting close to the top of the hour. So we don't want to keep anyone, if you want to get on with your day, again, if anyone has an additional okay, question. Uh, uh, Matt uh, saying that um, Slack is full, um, so that other Slack channel will be the place to participate. Yeah, Matt, you've, you've, you've hit exactly on the problem and why we're creating this additional Slack environment. So, um, uh, and, and that's, um, it's, it's coming out soon, right? Yeah, and part of the reason is we had, uh, we had uh, it tied to a Slack environment where each user, you know, has an annual fee and there are too many people to sustain that. So we're moving it to a Slack environment where there's no fees per user. Uh, we'll send yeah. out the information on the new Slack channel when we send the webinar slides and recordings. So. Exactly. Should be ready um, probably Monday at the latest. Well, thanks everybody for joining. This is the second in our series and we look forward to perhaps seeing you um, at in future webinars and um, maybe meeting you in person uh, at an upcoming uh, event.